Hello and welcome to part 10 of Let's Create a 2D Platformer in the Godot Game Engine. My name is Colin, and in this tutorial, not so many series, we'll be creating this 2D platformer video game. Of course, in this game, you control the player on screen. You can walk, run, jump, and fall. You can squash enemies, get hurt by enemies, and lose lives, collect coins, shoot fireballs, find keys to unlock doors. You know how 2D platformer games work. So at this point in our project, we have a character that can walk, run, jump, and fall. He can explore a large level. The camera follows us around that level. And as of the last video in this mini series, our player can now fall off a cliff into the abyss and the game will switch scenes. In fact, it'll just reload our game scene. So you'll restart the level if you fall out of a level off the bottom of the screen. If you've not seen that video, I'll put a link to that video, part nine in this mini series up on the screen right now. But in this video, we're going to start adding coins into our game. So in this video, we're going to make a coin object that we can create instances of. And as you hopefully know, at this point in Godot, when you make a new object that you want to reuse, you make that object out of its own new scene that you create instances of. But also in this video, we're going to talk about a bigger topic called collision layers and collision masks. Now, these are two not so flashy things that are a big part of Godot, but don't skip this part of this mini series because implementing collision layers and collision masks keeps your program organized. It prevents objects from being able to collide with one another when they're not supposed to, and that will save you from lots of headaches as you're designing this video game and video games in the future. So in this video, we're going to start adding coins into our game. And when you collect a coin, it will disappear out of the level. And we'll talk about how to manage all those collisions, all the collisions in your game. In fact, using collision layers and collision masks. By the way, if you've not seen the rest of this whole mini series on how to create a 2D platformer in the Godot game engine, this is part 10, but there have been nine parts so far. If you've not seen any of them, I'll put a link to this whole playlist with all my Godot 3 tutorials up on the screen right now. Go ahead and check that playlist out if you're missing any of the previous parts. But let's go ahead and jump into the Godot game engine. Of course, if you like this video or if you learned something in it, please go ahead and click on that like button below this video. It really helps me out and I really appreciate it. Of course, if you want to see more videos, like this one in the Godot game engine or in Blender or other technology, click on that subscribe button as well and click the bell icon to be notified whenever I upload a new tutorial. So this is our project as it stands. We have our little character. If I press the play scene button, of course, our game loads and I can control my player moving around my large, I was going to say little, my large world. And it's wonderful, except there's not a whole lot to do. So let's go ahead and add coins all around our world. Of course, we're going to start by creating a new scene. We'll get to that in just a moment, but we need sprites for our animated coin. Yes, it's going to be animated, so there's going to be at least a few frames of it spinning in place. I'll be giving you these resources. I have a coin folder on my desktop. These sprites, gold one, two, and three different frames of a rotating coin, of course, were made by www.kenny.nl. They are not a sponsor of this video. I just appreciate the game assets that they make. I think that they're all really of high quality. So go ahead and check them out if you like. But I will be giving you a link to download this coin folder with these three sprites in the description area below this video on YouTube, of course, for free. So you can download that, unzip it, and I'm going to now copy this folder, right click and copy, and I'm gonna go into my project folder. I'll double click and I have an assets folder just to keep things organized. And in there, I'm going to right click and paste. And now I've got my coin folder there with my three sprites. So back into the Godot editor, it will very quickly import that folder with those sprites. So now over here in my file system doc, I've got them right here. And now I'm going to create a new scene. That is my coin object that we can later create instances of. So to create a new scene, of course, you press the little plus button up on the top to create a new tab. It's an empty scene. We're not going to add a new root node of one of these types because our coin is going to be an area. Now you hopefully recognize that word, an area. It's actually an area 2D because in the last video in this mini series, we added an area 2D as this fall zone below our whole game so that when our player enters this kind of force field zone area, uh, it can detect the player 
coming into it. And if it does, then it emits a signal, which you can connect to a function that will do pretty much anything you program it to do in your game. A coin is going to be very similar. A coin is not going to be a physics object. A coin doesn't need to be bumped into. A coin doesn't need to be pushed around or fall and tumble and bump and fall into other things. It's just an area, a zone that can detect if the player enters it. So let's go ahead and with our new empty scene, press the plus button to add a new node. I'm going to add an area 2D. So I'll search for area and select area 2D. There we go. That's the root node of the scene. I'll rename it to, I'll double click to coin and I'll press enter. And now this root coin area 2D node needs both a collision shape to know what shape and size it is, and it needs an animated sprite. So I'm going to select that root node, press plus. I'm going to give it a collision shape 2D, not a collision polygon 2D, collision shape 2D. You might already have that in your recents. So I'll double click on collision shape 2D. Of course, it needs to know a shape. That's why it has a little error here. We'll worry about that in a moment, but I'm going to add, I'll select the root node and add an animated sprite. Of course, the blue 2D version. Okay, so animated sprite right there. So those are now both children of the root 2D uh, area 2D node. Okay, so our animated sprite has an error, and that's because if I select it, it does not have a sprite frames resource over here. So you might recall that in our main game, our player, our Steve character, has an animated sprite as well. This is how we created his idle pose or animation, his walk pose, his climbing pose, his in the air kind of jumping pose. It's the same thing. So our coin, it's animated sprite. We need to click on this little arrow with it selected and we're gonna make a new sprite frames Godot resource. And so there it is. If I click on it, it will open up the sprite frames dock at the bottom of Godot and it gives us a default animation that we can drag sprites into this area. I'm gonna double click on this default name and I'm gonna call it spin because our coin is gonna be spinning. And so now I can drag from our assets folder uh, in our file system dock, gold one, gold two, and gold three in that order. It's not a very um, complex animation. It only has three frames. So the spinning isn't that smooth. It's okay for this project. If I select the animated sprite over in my scene dock, I should enable playing. I'll turn playing on. So now even in the editor, you can see what it looks like. And if you want to change the speed, speed of this animation uh, from five to something higher. You can do that. I think five is okay. Maybe six or seven is okay. That's really up to you. And so now I'm going to give this uh, coin area 2D object its collision shape. Don't forget that. If I select collision shape 2D, I'm going to give it a new shape resource. It's going to be a circle shape. And because I added it first, it is behind the sprite. So if I drag this little red pinky handle out, you can see its size. And I don't mind making it a little bit bigger than the animated sprite. And you know what? That animated sprite is going too quick. I think five was actually a nicer number. Okay, so this looks pretty good to me. Before we save this coin scene, remember it's unsaved, we're going to add a script to the coin, the root node itself, the area 2D. So I'll select it and press this little script button and it's gonna call the script coin.gd, the same name as my root node, that's fine. I don't want it to have its template as the default. I'm gonna change it to no comments. Okay, that'll make the code cleaner and you'll see that in just a sec. I'm gonna press uh, create with coin.gd, that's fine, that's its name. Here it is, it's much cleaner than the uh, default template. There's no extra lines of comments. It's just very clean. In fact, you can get rid of the function ready. You don't need that, okay? But keep that top line, of course. I'm gonna do a control S to save. This will prompt me to save the scene itself. The scene will be called coin.tscn, that's a, a Godot scene, and I'll press save. And so now if I go back from my coin scene with nothing else in it except for the coin, go back to level one, I'm going to create an instance of the coin. So you're making instances, basically copies that refer to the original coin object 
into your level one. To do that, I'm gonna select my level one root node and I'm gonna press not the plus, remember I'm gonna select and press this little link button. This is actually called the instance a scene file has a node. It creates an inherited scene if no root node exists. So I'm gonna press this button and it'll show me all the scenes in my project. I'll select coin.tscn and press open. When I do that, it adds a coin into my game exactly the same as the coin scene. Although because this coin is an instance of the scene, if I update my scene later, of course, if I change things in my coin, which I will, it will propagate those changes out to all the coins that I make instances of in my project, which is really nice. So now if I select my coin instance and I place it somewhere, in my level, I'm using just my arrow tool, of course, and I go and play my level one, and I walk over and I jump to collect it, well, nothing happens because we haven't programmed the coin to detect if the player enters it. And I wanna point out the way that I said that, the coin hasn't detected if the player enters it. That's the way we're gonna be doing things. We're not gonna program our character to detect if it's collecting a coin, which might seem like the obvious thing to do, that's not what we're going to do. We're going to program or code the coin to detect if it detects a character, our player, entering it. And if the coin detects the player entering it, it's going to delete itself. It'll vanish from the game to make it look like it's being collected. So to do this, and by the way, this is exactly the same pretty much as our fall zone, where the fall zone has the code, including a signal to detect if the player enters it. Same thing here. I'm not going to edit this instance of the coin. I'm not gonna select the coin and go in the, uh, in the level one. I'm not gonna select this instance and go over and start working with its signals because this would change the signals just on this instance of the coin. I'm gonna go back to my coin scene. This is very important. And in the coin original scene, I'm gonna select its root node. And now I can go over to the node dock, the node tab up on the top right uh, and start working with my signals. So this is gonna be almost identical to that fall zone. We're going to enable our root coin area 2D's signal called body entered because this will detect if a physics body like our character, which is a kinematic body physics object, if a physics body enters the coin, it will emit a signal which will be handled by a function, a block of code that will run whenever this signal is triggered. So I'm going to double click on body entered with the coin root node selected. I'll double click. This window will pop up and it's asking me to pick an object that has a script, a node that has a script that I'm going to put that function on that will handle whenever this uh, event, this signal is emitted. So I'm gonna select the coin itself because the coin is going to delete itself and so it makes sense to put the code on it. So I'll select the coin, the root node, and it's gonna make a function called onCoinBodyEntered. And so I'll press connect. I am okay with that name. I'll press connect. It jumps us over into our script workspace. Of course, I can go back to 2D if I want. This script is called coin.gd and it had nothing in it except for that top line a few minutes ago, except now it has this function called onCoinBodyEntered, which we just made by linking the, the signal up to it. This little icon means that a signal is pointing to this function. It will run this function whenever that signal is emitted. And if I go back to the coin, I'll click on it and I go back to its node dock. You can see that same little icon is pointing to the name of that function. And because there's only a little dot, a little period here, that means that it's pointing to this same object uh, script. So it's the script here. Okay. All this script needs to do, or all this function needs to do is at least right now, delete the coin itself. How do you delete an instance of a coin or an object or a node in your game? It's really simple. The method call to delete an object itself is called queue free. And this is a method call. So if I double click, I started typing and knew what I was getting at. So if I double click on that and it's a method call, so it needs round brackets. If you're not aware, a queue is a lineup. It means you're waiting for something. And free in this case means to be freed from memory, to be freed from your game's RAM on your computer, your active running memory. So this method will line up 
this object to be freed from memory when it is ready to be freed. Sometimes objects have to wait like one cycle of your game loop or something like that to be freed. That's what this does, but essentially it'll just delete the object right away. That's all we need. If I do a control S on my keyboard to save and I go back to level one, if I go back to my 2D workspace and select the coin, you will notice that this instance of the coin now has that same signal and this instance of the coins script also now has that. We didn't edit this instance, we edited the original coin scene and those changes propagated out into my instance of my coin. So now if I play this scene and I go over and collect the coin, the coin disappears. Hey, it works great, but we're not done yet because our character is just one possible physics body that might come into contact with our coin. In a few videos from now, we're gonna be adding enemies and enemies are gonna be walking along the ground and we don't want our enemies to collect coins. So this is where we're gonna get into collision layers and collision masks. If I select any object in my game or in my scene doc, any node that is an object that can collide with any other object like Steve or my coin, and I go over to the inspector with that node selected, there is a section called collision. And in this section, there are a bunch of squares. And if you're familiar with older versions of Blender, like Blender 2.79 and earlier, you'll recognize these squares, this grid as layers. Now, these are not visual layers. These will not change what kind of layers like in Photoshop or GIMP that your item is visible on. No, this is a way of organizing objects into layers so you can separate out what groups of objects defined by their layer can collide with other objects. Now in Godot, these layers are visual, although you can name them as well. If I click on these two little dots next to this grid, uh, you can see there's layer names or layer one, two, three. We can actually name these to make more sense out of it all. So I'm gonna go up to my project settings. So the project menu, project settings, and this is a big confusing area, but under the first general tab, if I scroll all the way down to um, layer names, that section there, and I'm working in 2D and I'm interested in 2D physics layers. Here we have layer one and a space to name all these layers, layer one, layer two, etc. So what we're gonna be doing here is separating out objects onto different physics layers so that we can make sure that some types of objects can't collide with other types of objects and some can. So my first layer, I'm gonna dedicate it to my player. Seems simple, there's only gonna be one object on this layer at any one time, but it's important. So I'm gonna name this first layer player. And my second layer, platform. And I'm gonna keep going. My third layer is going to be, can you guess? It's gonna be fall zone because we don't want any object to be detected by the fall zone. So we'll put the fall zone on its own layer. Let's keep going. I'm going to name the next layer uh, item and then the next layer, enemy. So now we've named our first five layers. We have lots more that we could name and we will use more of these in the future. I think the next layer I will name a fireball because when we add fireball shooting into our game, those should be, those fireballs should be on their own layer. So here we go. We have our layers named. If you need to pause the video, please do get those down the same as me. I suggest to keep yourself sane and I will press close. Now we have the job of separating out our objects into those different layers. And again, this is important, so don't skip it, because as I pointed out in the last video in this mini-series, you know, if you were to have other objects in your game, like maybe you had barrels that were rolling like in the old classic Donkey Kong game, and they were physics objects, maybe they were tumbling in your game, and maybe a barrel happened to uh, come into contact with your fall zone, well, the fall zone right now just you know, whenever an, a physics body enters it, it restarts your game. And you don't obviously want, if you were to add those barrels, uh, you don't want the game to restart whenever a barrel gets to the fall zone, okay? So it's important to separate out your different objects into different layers. What we're gonna do is we're going to select each object that can collide. So I'll select my coin and I'll press these two little dots under collision in the inspector and it should now have these names. If these don't load right away and you have named your uh, layers 
up in your project settings, you might just need to switch to a different node and then switch back and then they should be named. So this coin that I have selected is going to be an item, but this coin is an instance of a scene. So rather than uh, actually, you know, specify the collision layer on this instance, I'm gonna go back to my coin scene and I'm gonna select the root node and I'm gonna go to collision and layer. We're gonna select uh, item and I'm gonna uncheck player. So now you can see if I click somewhere else that this item is on this collision layer layer four, if you're counting one, two, three, and four. So if I go back to my level one scene, I'll go back to the coin and do a control S to save. If I go back to level one and select that coin, hopefully now that change is here. I'm gonna select Steve and I'm gonna go to Steve's inspector and his collision and I'm gonna make sure he is on the player collision layer. Uh, that works, he's on layer one. Let's go ahead now and edit the collision layers of our tiles. We've got tiles one way and tiles solid. So I'll select each one of those, go to collision. We'll select the platform layer and uncheck player for each one of those. So that one is now right. I'll select tile solid, go to collision layer and uncheck player and go to platform. That's what I want. The parallax background and all of its layers, they are not collidable objects. They're just in the background. So I can collapse that whole branch of my tree and I don't need to worry about it. It doesn't collide. But my fall zone, it does collide. So I'll select it and then go over to collision and I will select the fall zone layer and uncheck player. So now hopefully if I double check, the coin is on the item layer. That's what I want. And so now all the items are separated onto their own layers. What does this mean for our gameplay? Well, if I press the play scene button, what happens? Well, my player falls and lands and this is working. You might think, well, why is my player now colliding with the floor if they're on separate layers? Aren't different layers supposed to isolate themselves from one another? Yes, but there is another piece to this puzzle. If I close my playable game, there is the collision mask. And if I hover over the description of mask, it says the physics layers area, this scans for collisions. This is not a very clear uh, definition of what masks are, and they are a little bit hard to understand. Essentially, when you enable one of the layers in the collision mask section of an object, you are telling that object what other layers this object can collide with. Now, I have my Steve node selected right now, and as you can see, Steve is on layer one, the player collision layer, and Steve right now only knows how to, or only will detect other objects on his same layer. But if I go and select the tile solid node, the tile solid are on layer two, but they know how to see all of these tiles that have static body physics objects, essentially, they know how to detect or they will detect objects on the collision layer one because I have this enabled. If I were to disable the layer one mask and then I were to press the play scene button, well, Steve would fall right through the platforms because the platforms don't detect Steve colliding with them. So as you can see, hopefully it gets a little bit confusing because you don't have to have things in two directions. I don't have to have Steve be able to detect the platforms on the platform layer. I just have to have the platforms be able to detect Steve or perhaps the other way around. If I were to select Steve's node and then go over to his collision mask section and enable him to detect anything on the platform collision layer. In fact, I don't need Steve to detect anything on his own layer. That's okay because there are no other objects on his layer. And I were to play my scene, would this work? Yes, it would. So let's go ahead and kind of organize things in terms of collision layers and collision masks. I'm going to start from the top in my scene. My tiles one way. Well, hopefully they are on the platform layer. That's what I want. What can platforms detect or what should they be able to detect? They should detect anything that is a player. And because enemies are also going to be in our game and they'll also fall with gravity, I want the uh, platforms to detect players and enemies and perhaps even fireballs as well because fireballs will bounce in our game. The same layers or mask layer should be selected for my tile solid, of course. So I'll select tile solid, go over to mask, 
It will detect uh, players and enemies and fireballs. I think that's the same that I had before. I will just double check. Yes, that's right. But the player should be able to detect lots of things. So I'm going to enable a platform. That's right. Fall zone. That's right. If I don't have this enabled and I don't have the fall zone be able to detect items in the player layer, well, that wouldn't work. The fall zone wouldn't cause the scene to reset like we want. So that's important. The player should definitely be able to detect things that are items and enemies and fireballs. Probably not so much because the player is going to be shooting fireballs. And so we'll leave that uh, unselected. So I think that's right. The fall zone. Well, the fall zone is going to be on the fall zone layer and definitely it should be able to detect uh, players. But again, it should not detect enemies or items or other fall zones or platforms. So that's what we want. Last but not least, the coin. But again, we're not going to edit the collision layer and masks of this instance of the coin. That is very important. Don't start editing these. You'll welcome yourself to a whole bunch of frustration if you do. Only edit the original coin scenes, uh, collision layer and collision masks. Okay. The coin is an item, so it should be on the item layer. Although right now we actually don't need to even put the coin on any collision layer because no other object is actually going to be looking for the coin. And so it might save your game a little bit of computer resources like CPU processes and RAM and things like that if you don't put this object on anything because it only needs to detect the player and no other object needs to detect it. So it actually doesn't need to go on any layer, but it does need to be able to detect the player and only the player and that's what we want. I will go ahead and save my scene, the coin scene. I'll go back to level one and save it as well. Let's go ahead and see if things work if I press play scene. The game will load and I fall and I collide with the ground. That's nice. I can jump up through one-way platforms. My coin was collected. I can keep on wandering around. And if I fall off the edge of the cliff, nothing happens. So something isn't quite right there. I'm going to pause this video and I'll come back when I've solved it. And the problem seemed to be that I had actually commented out the line of code that actually makes us change scenes when our player collides with the fall zone. So if I go to Steve's script, you can see in the function at the bottom called on fall zone body entered, I had added a pound sign or a hashtag to the beginning of our line of code that actually makes the scene change. I don't know why I commented that out, but I will bring that back and I'll get rid of this pass line and I'll save. I'll go back to my 2D workspace and I'll press the play scene button. And now hopefully, of course, I can walk and collide with platforms. I can collect coins and I can fall off the edge of my ground and my scene will restart. Last but not least in this video, we don't want just one coin. We want lots of coins. If I select my coin in my scene doc, I can double click on it and name it coin one. That'll make things easier. And if I right click on it, I can say duplicate. It'll make a copy. And of course, with the arrow tool, I can move that coin around. I'll put a few coins up on this upper platform. So I'll duplicate this one and then move it over. And as you can see, it's really as easy as that. If I press the play scene button, now I've got all those coins in my level and I can collect them all. We are not yet counting the coins and we'll handle that in the next video in this mini series. We'll also in that video make a little coin animation. So the coin bounces and then after it finishes its little bounce animation, then it'll disappear. And we're going to enable us to be able to count coins. And if you collect a certain number that you can specify, well, then you'll win and we'll change scenes and we'll reload our game level. So we'll cover those things in the next video. But that will be it for this video. Of course, if you like this video, if you learned something in it, please go ahead and click on that like button below this video. It really helps out me and my channel. And if you want to see more videos like this one in the Godot game engine or in Blender or other technology, click on that subscribe button as well and click the bell icon to be notified whenever I upload a new tutorial. Check out my Facebook page and my Instagram page. In those two places, I post sneak peeks and previews of what I'm working on next. It's where I communicate with you guys the most. But that'll be it for this video. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. <laughs>